So we're going to open a very rare bottle from our reserve program called Framboesa Atondo. It's made with Belgian dark candy sugar, raspberry juice, and Arizona honey. It spent a year in a Sandeman's 10-year-old tawny port barrel back in our office when we uh, were making mead here and in our tasting room. So everything around me was once a production facility. It was our first expansion. And we started making mead here in 2014. By 2016, we had made 6,800 gallons of mead and cider in this 400 square foot space with a couple barrels hiding out there. But this is a truly special mead. It's one of the highest rated meads in the world on rate beer and untapped. And we're gonna see how this is aging. So from, from when this was born, before it went into a barrel and was done fermenting, we're going back seven years now. So it's always kind of cool to, uh, to look and evaluate a cork as well. And so this was stored properly on its side and you can see that the cork did its job. It didn't leak anywhere. And our corks are hand punched Portuguese corks. So cork trees, it's a, it's a species of oak that grows in, in Portugal and Spain. And when you drive through the back roads of Portugal, especially towards the Spanish border, you'll see these trees where they have, they, they have two different colors. And there's kind of like this, you know, terracotta color where they have just harvested the cork, like in a circumferential um, incision around the tree. And you'll see these trucks driving by you just stacked with cork this thick or thicker in these rows, which is this spongy bark. And cork has different qualities, different, different levels of quality based on how thick the cork is. So you can spend a nickel on a very inexpensive cork, or you can spend 40 cents on a top of the line cork. And when I say hand punched, there's a, a device kind of like a cookie cutter that they'll use that's exactly like this, and they push it down with their hands, pick it up, and now they've got where the cookie cutter cut out of the cork, a cork that's ready to go into a bottle. And this cork was actually a little thicker than this when we first got it, and so, a bottle corker will actually compress the cork. It squeezes it and then pushes it in. And that's why corks are hard to come back out of a bottle. That's why you need a corkscrew, something mechanical to, to help you out. And our corks have our Superstition Meadery Award mark on there. And then we actually have, have branded our bull logo, which is really cool on each end. So this cork did its job. It's in outstanding shape. Smells like this is gonna taste, it smells great. So you would wanna sort of evaluate, especially something that's older, if there's anything off in the nose. Uh, it's important to try and determine that before you sip it, because once you start to taste something, the aroma and your ability to detect those is gonna change a little bit, sometimes enhanced, but there's always things you can pick up in the beginning. So temperature is important too when you're evaluating something. A lot of times we serve things that are chilled, and, and when you do that, that's, that's cool. And some products, especially like carbonated ciders, like you want to enjoy chilled, kind of like a beer. Uh, white wines are often served, you know, 50 to 55 degrees. Red wines are often served at, you know, in the 60s. But when it comes to mead, it really depends on what you're drinking, how it was made, how it was aged, what's the sweetness level, the ABV, uh, all can, can impact like the ideal, the optimal uh, enjoying temperature. So this was from our, our cellar and it's very cool back there. So this is probably 55 or 60 degrees right now. And as it warms up, like you can actually hold the, the, the glass in your hands and you can, you can introduce heat to the product to release these volatile aromatic compounds. And the reason why wine glasses have stems is so that you don't do that. So that when you are served something in say a nice restaurant by sommelier, um, that's the temperature you're supposed to enjoy it at. And, but you always have that option if something is chilled and you want to experience it different as it, as it opens up, you can, you can always warm your glass. It's also um, common practice and, and it helps flavors express themselves or helps the product open up if you introduce a little oxygen. And so I'm swirling this and the shape of the glass is concentrating these aromas. Wow, right to the lip. That smells amazing. You know there's raspberries in there. You don't have to use your imagination at all. Sometimes we'll do things that are subtle, but other times, in this case, you don't have to use your imagination whatsoever to detect the beautiful aromas coming out of this. Raspberry, honey, oak, 
I'm getting cherries, tannins. It smells like, like the skin on a raspberry versus like the juice. It smells very bright. It does not smell like it's going to be sweet, but I know from experience it's going to have some sweetness to it. And I'm getting aromatic compounds from the honey, but I'm not really detecting, I'm not expecting, if I didn't know what this was, that it's going to be sweet. All right, let's see how it tastes. That is unbelievable. It, it is still sweet, I would say, Semi-sweet for me, this would be certainly sweet for a wine drinker. You know, probably somewhere in between uh, a late harvest Zinfandel and a port, maybe even approaching port. Sweetness, if it was kind of drier, there's, there's a little bit of an oxidative character. But not much. I was expecting it to be more like a tawny port or a Madeira. And the, the raspberry in here is so much brighter than I expected it to be after being seven years old. It is lip smackingly tart, but balanced in the greatest of ways from the honey and the caramelized beet sugar, which is what Belgian dark candy sugar is. Wow, that is beautiful. 